I think we can start already. Are we ready? Uh, dear colleagues, dear audience, uh, welcome to the online discussion, Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact and the Holocaust, organized on behalf of the informal group of members of European Parliament on European Remembrance to commemorate uh, the International Day in memory of the victims of the Holocaust. Mm, first, some technical details. Uh, please turn off your microphones at the bottom of the screen. We have two speak speakers. Uh, a big thank uh, you uh, for them. Uh, they will share their insights with uh, a 10 to 15 minute speech. Then we will conclude the discussion and follow with the question answer panel. You can give written questions uh, at the bottom of your screen. Uh, the discussion will be held in English and Russian languages. You can use uh, uh, simultaneous interpretation. Uh, between these languages will be provided uh, in the Zoom uh, platform. The discussion will focus on uh, the tragedy of the Holocaust um, in the crossroads of two biggest totalitarian regimes and how Russia's current historical revisionism and state fuel disinformation use the sensitivities of the Holocaust, uh, World War II and Soviet remembrance to further divide and weaken Europe. This week in European Parliament uh, commemorated the International Holocaust Remembrance Day for the first time remotely, but uh, nonetheless together. Every year, fewer and fewer witnesses remain among us to tell their stories and remind us not to forget. Eventually, they will leave us, but Europe will have to continue living with the baggage of its past. Most importantly, we should try to live with a past that is understood fully and clearly. Now we can hardly imagine that something similar could happen in today's Europe. We believe that we stand on a strong foundation of democracy, but not everyone in Europe lives, lives in a democracy. We see brutal regimes in the East of Europe and the democracies that we have uh, cannot be taken uh, for granted. They need to be taken care of to stay alive Keeping the memory of the darkest chapters of our history is key to making uh, sure that we do not repeat them. Uh, 2018 poll in the largest members of the EU has shown that one in 20 Europeans have never even heard of the Holocaust. And if we do not actively remember them, they can very easily be forgotten. I am sure that even less people know about atrocities and uh, everything happened in Soviet Union. This is why we have founded the Remembrance Group at the European Parliament. This is why in 2019, we adopted the EP resolution on the importance of European remembrance for the future of Europe with a strong majority of members of European Parliament across different political groups. Turning to our today's event, why is it called like this? Why is the name of our conference is like this? I have to admit, uh, I have been strongly inspired by many books, but including the book of Timothy Snyder, Black Earth, the Holocaust as History and Warning. I have spent half of my life living among the lies of the Soviet empire. What I and so many people like me knew about was not the Holocaust, but the mass graves of Soviet victims buried near so many towns and villages, including my native town. Only now we have, we started, uh, we started to uncover the real horrors of our past squeezed between two totalitarian regimes, the Soviet and the Nazi ones. 
Timothy Snyder has helped me understand why the worst atrocities of the Holocaust took place in the lands that have lived through double occupation of both uh, tyrannical regimes. But today we will have a chance to listen to the historians tell the story of the past, but also of the present. European Parl Parliament has recently established a temporary special committee on foreign interference in all democratic processes in the European Union, including disinformation. One of the questions that we address there is how history is being used in disinformation campaigns. World War II, the Holocaust, resistance against the Soviet occupation, all of this is used to divide and discredit the societies living in the neighborhood of Russia, not only European Union, Ukraine, Belarus, uh, Moldova, other countries we see uh, facing the same situation. To start the discussion about the very interesting but difficult topic, I would like to give the floor to the first speaker. Uh, we are honored to have him uh, together with us. Uh, and I introduce uh, Dr. Roger Moorhouse, uh, who is a historian and author specializing in Nazi Germany, Poland, and World War II in Europe topics. His speech theme today is about the differences between the Western narrative of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact and the war, and of the war, the Central European narrative and um, a place within the experiences of 1939-41. The floor is yours, uh, Dr. Roger. There we go. Right, uh, hopefully you can hear me. Um, thank you, first of all, for the uh, kind invitation. It's a, a very important subject uh, to be talking about, particularly this week. Um, the first thought that sprang to mind with this, this question of a, a juxtaposition that is implied by, by our subject today, a juxtaposition uh, between the Nazi Soviet pact in some way and the Holocaust, this is not really uh, a juxtaposition that many in the Western half of Europe would necessarily ever make. Uh, the problem is not the Holocaust. The Holocaust is of course very well known, at least in its essentials, uh, despite the sort of shocking, rather shocking statistic of, of, uh, of popular ignorance of the subject that you just mentioned. Um, but it's, it is rather well known, but you could never say the same about the Nazi Soviet pact. That is certainly not well known. So consequently, any attempt, I think, to juxtapose the two in any way for, for any analytical purposes uh, is going to be much more difficult in uh, Western Europe than it is in the continent's eastern half, where the real significance of the Nazi Soviet pact is much better understood uh, because of that, uh, that visceral uh, personal experience of its consequences. To clarify that point, in the Western narrative of World War II, the Nazi Soviet pact is viewed simply as the last diplomatic chess move before the German invasion of Poland on the 1st of September, 1939. Thereafter, the pact appears to really disappear from the story. It's not really present. This is of course, in the, particularly in British narrative, the opening phase of the war is what we call the phony war. This is the period in which not much happens uh, before, before certainly May of 1940 with the German attack westward. So this is a period in, in which th there's not much going on in the Western narrative. So um, what the very real fighting and the very real suffering going on in the Eastern half of Europe is really not part of the story. My argument is that it should be, of course, but it isn't. So uh, Nazi Soviet pact effect effectively disappears from our narrative. Uh, after its signature on the 23rd of August 1939, uh, and it disappears along with its consequences. The consequences being the 22 months of German-Soviet collaboration and the Soviet invasion and occupation of Eastern, of, uh, Eastern Poland, of the Baltic States and of Bessarabia. And obviously, if those aspects of the story are absent from the narrative, and it makes it rather difficult to address the issue that we have before us today, 
which is that of the, any links between the Nazi Soviet pact and the Holocaust. Of course, responsibility for launching the Holocaust lies with Hitler and his Nazi regime, but there are nonetheless countless instances of collaboration, formal and informal, official and unofficial, uh, that uh, litter the story of the Holocaust itself, all the way from the uh, the Vichy regime rounding up French Jews for de deportation at the, the Veldiv and sending them to Drancy and elsewhere, uh, to the actions of individuals betraying their Jewish neighbours to the German authorities, as, for example, is uh, suspected in the case of Anne Frank. Now, as numerous studies have shown, the motives for individual collaboration however fleeting that might have been, uh, were many and varied and are not always ideological. Fear, greed, and the concept of anticipatory obedience could also play a part in a, an individual's decision to collaborate or to betray a neighbor. To this list, and in the context of our discussions today, we can add the idea of misplaced revenge by the time of the German invasion of the Soviet Union in June 1941, populations of Eastern Poland, the Baltic States and Bessarabia had all endured Soviet occupation, annexation and forced Sovietization, along with all the horrors and cruelties those processes entailed, including arbitrary arrests, persecution, judicial murder and mass deportation to the Soviet interior. In such circumstances, it should not surprise us that elements in those populations would want to avenge their suffering once the Soviet regime faltered in the summer of 1941, once it was attacked by Hitler's forces. However, given that the rightful targets of that revenge, the Soviet bureaucrats, soldiers and administrators who had overseen the communist regimes had already fled, popular ire was often leveled at the Jews, motivated in part by the spurious concept of Judeo-Bolshevism, the lazy conflation of Jewishness and communism, which was a staple of right-wing world view at the time, and in part by the memory of the enthusiasm with which some in the Jewish community had initially greeted the Soviet invasions of 1939 and 1940, believing the Kremlin's propaganda of equality and fraternity. It's in this context, I would suggest, that instances of collaboration and apparently spontaneous violence against Jews in the region, such as the Liatukis garage mass massacre in Kaunas or the massacre at Yadvabne, should be seen. They should be seen as misplaced revenge for the horrors inflicted by the Soviet regimes regimes which had been spawned in turn by the Nazi Soviet pact. One should always beware of monocausal explanations for events, of course, and this is no exception. As I have explained, there are many motivations on a personal level for acts of collaboration, but this must be considered as one of those plausible motivations. The second point that springs to mind from this juxtaposition is that this period under discussion allows us the possibility for this most complex and controversial still thing, a comparison between those two odious regimes, Stalin's USSR and Hitler's Third Reich, especially as for those 22 months of the Nazi Soviet, uh, Nazi -Soviet pact, those two regimes co cooperated and collaborated side by side in the occupation and destruction of Poland. Germany committed the original sin in carrying out the Holocaust, and I fervently believe that the Holocaust was uniquely evil. The USSR under Stalin ran Hitler a close second. Both regimes murdered, deported and enslaved in pursuit of their utopias and Soviet crimes continued past 1945. And yet, those same Soviet crimes are scarcely recognized in the Western narrative. This disparity is remarkable, frankly. While the Holocaust is rightly commemorated 
across the civilized world, Soviet crimes are barely mentioned, barely taught, and so barely penetrate the public consciousness. Auschwitz is rightly a household word, yet Kolima or Norilsk would barely raise a flicker of recognition to most of us. And for those who would balk at such comparisons, I would remind them that that is what historians do. It doesn't necessarily imply parity between the things being compared, but comparing and contrasting is an essential part of the historical process. It's an essential part of the analytical toolkit. Indeed, the Kremlin's recent efforts to freeze that historical process by banning that very comparison and setting a neo-Stalinist narrative of an unblemished Red Army in stone is very instructive. The Kremlin has clearly not forgotten Orwell's line, he who controls the past controls the future. Russia's attempt to control the past, its denial of the possibility of comparison is fundamentally ahistorical. Indeed, I would argue it is anti-history. It is the historian's task to explain events and to embrace their complexity. And of course, to explain is not to excuse. But the difficulty in this case is that any appreciation of the very real consequences of the Nazi Soviet pact is so weak outside those areas of Central and Eastern Europe most immediately affected by the pact that any coherent understanding of these wider issues is built on very fragile foundations. It's worth mentioning here and applauding the efforts of uh, the, those behind the uh, commemoration of 23rd of August as Black Ribbon Day uh, within the European Parliament. That's, that's certainly making a difference, I think, in, in awareness of these issues. But one can only hope that this situation can be remedied further by improved historical uh, awareness, outside of Russia at least, uh, by the increased presence of more diverse voices in the Western narrative of the war, and of course by an excellent uh, initiatives such as this one. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Moorhouse. Really, you reminded us uh, that uh, it's no history uh, which already ended and we can forget it. Uh, as you uh, mentioned, uh, the narratives in uh, current Russia, they are using that uh, controlling the past, you control the future, uh, is still, still very important one. And historical awareness, as you already uh, uh, mentioned, is also has to be on our agenda in European Parliament and uh, elsewhere as uh, for us as politicians. It's very important to have this uh, um, collaboration with historians and uh, that this is what I think we have to do. And now we will move uh, and it's my honor to introduce the second speaker, Ms. Irina Lazarevna uh, Sherbakova. She is a historian, manager of educational programs and member of the board of the International Organization Memorial in Russia. Uh, she is connected from Moscow. Uh, Gospoja Irina, vam slova. I, uh, Dear Irina, the floor is that, yours. Uh, uh, we, you, you can listen in English as well because interpretation is allowed. So. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. I may now start. My apologies for speaking uh, in the Russian language. It's easier for me. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a very urgent and relevant topic. Uh, 32 years passed since the meeting of the deputies of the Soviet Union, who in December 1989 acknowledged 
the fact of secret protocols agreed to the conclusions of the State Commission. And you know, it was one of the main logos of Perestroika, open up truth about the past and the pact related history alongside with other communist regime secrets uh, was a very important one. Without it, the question regarding independence of the Baltic states couldn't have been solved. It wouldn't have been possible to build relations with Poland because there is a direct link to Katyn crimes which were not acknowledged by the Soviet regime. At that time, it became obvious for many people that without historic truth, it is impossible to solve the question of democratization of the country in the broadest sense of the word. And of course, 32 years ago, when we, the historians of that time, who set up the memorial organization in 1989, and by the way, one of the first historic exhibitions was dedicated to the pact because 1989 commemorated the 50th anniversary of the pact. And it was very difficult to imagine back then that 32 years later, the very question of secret protocols, the pact-related questions, will be treated not from the historic, but from political perspective. And uh, what is the most important, speaking about uh, history of the Second World War, you know, under the influence of propaganda and under the influence of our official ideological position in, in my country, they want to detach the Second World War from the Great War. And in that situation, very many questions would have no answers. And the history of the Great uh, war in the USSR or in Russia would become an icon where uh, historians have no say, because if it is an icon, there can be no black or white colors. And from the uh, a historian's perspective, it's, you know, it's going back. How can I compare it? Even if I compare it to after Stalin's period, it will be a huge step backwards. You know, when I was at school back in the 60s, we, we spoke about responsibility of Stalin's government for the mistakes and the tragedy which took place after the war started. And, you know, these strategies are directly related to the history of the pact. And now they're trying to disconnect those things. They want to rehabilitate Stalin. We hear about it all the time. And this is about this disconnection, this detachment, about taking away the responsibility of the state, of Stalin, for what happened after 22nd of June 1941, and this tragedy, the tragedy of the first months of war, is of course based on the Stalin's policy, including the pact. Any attempt today to say that it was a diplomatic move, a diplomatic step, or a diplomatic success, uh, it's nonsense. I mean, we now have the historic, uh, historical science and any logics. The simple logics was clear to regular people, even to simple soldiers who ended up in the front at that time. They were told that, of course, we will win over Germany very soon, but 
At that time, it seemed that we will win over any enemy, but things turned out to be different. And in the autumn 1941, there were three million of uh, Soviet military uh, captures and so many Soviet um, citizens ended up in the territory occupied by Germany. All of this is a consequence of pre-war Stalin's policy. And then it is not clear why such a tragedy took place in autumn 1941. What about the tragedy with the peaceful population? Of course, there are political and psychological mental aspects to that. If we acknowledge that it was a consequence of terrible mistakes of uh, the Stalin's government, then we should acknowledge also their responsibility for what had happened and for the price that was paid to win the war. This current ideological construction, where the only victory of war is emphasized, but what about the price of this victory? The price was terrible, and to know, today we know the price. It was secret for decades, but we are speaking about 28 million of Soviet people who died. We know about it, and this brings us to the topic of Holocaust, too. The pact and what followed later put something into the heads of people, uh, people and officials. Um, it put a lot of chaos in their heads because suddenly information was discontinued. I mean, information about what was happening in other countries. Uh, people didn't know about anti-Semite policy of uh, Hitler's pol uh, politics. There was a ghetto in Warsaw and Soviet citizens had no idea what was going on there. And we were not, uh, they were not ready to what was to come because they didn't know what was going on in the territories nearby. People were not informed for, uh, for the entire months after the pact. People didn't know what was going on in Poland. My great grandmother never believed that something bad can happen. She would never believe. And she remained there and she was killed together with other relatives. She just did not believe that that could be possible. There was no evacuation organized. Of course, it would, be, would have been difficult to organize it, but at least people could have been told that you have to run from Germans. But, you know, it was a different policy. Don't panic. And... Holocaust is something uh, done by Hitler's army, no doubt, but the soldiers who fought in the war and who died liberating the Soviet Union, they had no chance in the beginning. It was a matter of survival. And these soldiers had only one idea in their head and heart to free the country from fascism. They didn't think about possible repressions of the communist regime. Therefore, a very complicated dilemma emerges here. Maybe it is reflected in literature and in arts in some way. In the novel of Grossman, Life and Fate, we have to fight over fascism, although communism also had many victims and many repressions um, 
came later. So, in that setting of horrible crimes by Nazis, the Soviet regime didn't speak about them, and people had no information about it, and Roger mentioned about it. There was no information about what was going on in the occupied territories, and people thought that you know, it's Soviet soldiers who are being killed or Soviet people who are being killed. And uh, there was no publicity about Jews. Uh, there was... That situation remained for a very long time, actually up to the perestroika. And this is what we should speak about. Not only secret protocols were kept secret, not the beginning of war was kept secret, but the remembrance of Holocaust was secret. No monuments were constructed and one could have only guessed that uh, there, is some, there was something to do with Jews. And the, the aim of this was to liquidate a remembrance not only of uh, Jewish people. There is not a single Jewish family that hadn't lost uh, relatives. In my case, it was great grandmother, in other families, grandparents, and so on. Three million people died, uh, three million Jews died on the Soviet territories. So it's uh, the general general remembrance, not only uh, remembrance of Holocaust regarding Jews, but uh, general remembrance was under taboo. And it led us to a situation when people forgot about it. And if you think about it, it was rather convenient because, you know, it's quite hard to remember something that you have witnessed, something terrible that had happened. And such memories are extremely pressing. And what I want to say is that it's our common European work. It's uh, something that the Eastern Europe should also be involved. And 30 years ago, I thought that such remembrance of those crimes, Nazi crimes, communist crimes, I thought that such memory would unite us. I thought, okay, there will be independent Baltic states, the USSR will collapse, but all of us are war survivals. All of us are survivors of communist crimes. Oh, some of us are survivors of Holocaust. And I thought that that would be something that would unite us. But actually, it turned out to be something much more complex. And as a result, it led us not to the dialogue of memory, but it led us to a situation where this pain can be manipulated with. Uh, Russia uses this to show, to write about collaboration. Yes, there was collaboration on a rather large scale. We can't even imagine the scale because the occupational re regime was really terrible. And people in Ukraine were against uh, communism, and therefore there was uh, some collaboration. But we cannot be quiet about participation of the local population in collaboration. This truth will emerge anyway. On the other hand, using this fact, using memory of col uh, collaboration for political manipulation is also a completely political manipulation. A use of memory, use of monuments, use of graves, use of names of hundreds of thousands killed soldiers, 
and their blood, use of all of this for blaming is a very poor manipulation. What is worse is that we see in Russia a lot of censorship going on. It is forbidden by our constitution, but nevertheless, we see the attempts to turn history into propaganda, to forbid some topics. And all of this leads to censorship. And, you know, thanks to internet, thanks to hundreds of thousands of documents being published, people become aware, they now know about Katyn, they know the truth about many historic facts, and these things cannot be secret again. And people cannot be forced to be quiet. People cannot be forced to shut up and not speak about crimes of the communist regime. Yes, the uh, Soviet Union won the war, but uh, at what price? If uh, people are forced to be quiet, it will not lead to anything apart from isolation. These laws are being masked in different ways. They are presented under different formula, but no one in the world, no one can doubt that the USSR won the Great War. So any laws against those who don't accept this victory is uh, absurd. So this is what I wanted to tell you today. Thank you very much. You know, I Please never apologize for speaking Russian. It's me now. Thank you very much for joining us today. And you know, it was a great pleasure listening to you. And I heard some new ideas, new thoughts, which uh, we will use in the future, especially when you spoke about the dialogue that never took place. And in that very group in the parliament, we would like to ensure such a dialogue. We want to see it started. Unfortunately, the tragedies are terrible. They are different for different people, for Jews and for others. We cannot compare them. We cannot say who suffered more or who suffered less. It's nonsense. But how can we build a dialogue, not only with the Russian Federation, uh, with a regime which doesn't want the dialogue, but even within Europe, within the European Union, how to avoid manipulations. And not to use it for any political goals. Mm, thank you very much for your insights. I think uh, we will have a possibility 
afterwards, after the comments, we will get now again to switch on with uh, your comments and uh, Dr. Roger may be listening uh, uh, other speakers uh, uh, got some impressions or some uh, insights to share again with us a little bit more on that. And now uh, it's time for comments. I ask uh, uh, for comments, Dr. Lukasz Kaminski, a Polish historian and president of the Platform of European Memory and Conscience, Conscience our group partner, I would say, I, I can say so, a friend of uh, our Remembrance Group in our activities, and we are very happy to, uh, to have you today from Warsaw, as I understand. Please, floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good morning. Thank you for uh, the invitation for uh, this interesting uh, panel. And um, my position as commentator uh, after um, hearing so good specialists in the field is a little bit hard because it's uh, not easy to add something new to those uh, things which were already, uh, already said. So uh, first, uh, I would like to stress that I agree that uh, um, uh, we should blame for Holocaust, um, the Nazi Germany, anti-Semitism, etc. Yeah? And our, the goal of our discussion or our debate today is not to, to change this, um, uh, this situation, but uh, if we uh, want to uh, understand uh, the Second World War and all of its uh, aspects, we need to have a possibility of free discussion of various topics, including the consequences of robot, uh, molotov ribbentrop, uh, ribbentrop uh, pact also in this, uh, uh, in this, uh, in this, in this sphere. Um, the, the problems uh, with, with com communism, which were already mentioned by uh, Ms. Shilbakova, um, are that uh, as the whole region is Central Europe, uh, we were not only uh, suffering of decades of communist dictatorship, but we were also deprived of the possibility to freely discuss um, the Second World War uh, just after it, you know, when, when it was when it was finished, uh, because of censorship, because of uh, the post policy of communist uh, uh, regimes, uh, there was uh, no chance to uh, to discuss all of these uh, complex and so, sometimes hard, um, uh, hard issues. Uh, so uh, somehow after the fall of the communism, we did not only start a debate about the crimes of communism, our experience under, uh, under communism, but also the topic of uh, Holocaust and uh, the whole aspects uh, of Second World War returned uh, to our um, uh, to our uh, to our region, and sometimes this debate was not easy, as uh, as, as it was said. For example, the problem of uh, collaboration of some parts of local populations with um, uh, with, with with Nazis, yes? and and I think in almost all countries uh, uh, there were some debates uh, on this topic, but. Uh, we should stress it. Yeah, there were debates, and we are open for 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 debate, uh, uh, even uh, if it's touching uh, some very delicate or hard uh, to accept um, uh, issues. And this de debate, as it was said, uh, is is the main thing I think we are missing because uh, uh, since. 10 years at least, uh, that the problems of remembrance, of understanding of Second World War are returning on a big scale in Europe because of various, uh, various reasons. Uh, and um, uh, at least not in every partner, we have a partner who is open for a discussion. Uh, and uh, mm, I remember that uh, because Ms. Sherbakova mentioned that uh, in 1989, when uh, this very important, or it was, I think, late 88, when this uh, important resolution, uh, no, no, 89, uh, was adopted uh, regarding by, uh, by, by the new Soviet parliament uh, elected, uh, regarding um, the uh, Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, uh, you said that it was understood as a key issue for process of democratization yeah? and, and I think we all uh, agree with it but I remember also that uh, 
uh, um, in, in, in the very end of the cadency of President Medvedev, uh, the Council of Human Rights under the President of Russian Federation prepared uh, a document uh, on Russian possible position uh, regarding the past, uh, regarding the Second World War, but not only the, the whole communist period. Uh, and there was another sentence that uh, dealing with the past, open discussion, open debate uh, on this issue is also crucial for the modernization of the country. Yeah? That there is not only no democracy, but uh, uh, also modernization of the uh, country is in fact impossible or very hard without uh, open discussion um, about the past, with, without some attempts to deal with it. Uh, and uh, I regret that uh, this document was not implemented, in fact, uh, by, by the authorities of the Russian uh, Federation, because many parts of, uh, of, of it was, were very, quite, uh, quite good and, and uh, could lead us to another situation. Unfortunately, right now we have uh, uh, the situation in which um, um, the authorities of, of Russian Federation are mainly focused on propaganda and unfortunately also disinformation regarding the Second, uh, Second World War and many um, structures of the state are involved in this, uh, in this process, in this uh, policy, including diplomacy. And if we just check uh, the tweets from a Russian um, foreign ministry or embassies around the world, not only in Europe, uh, uh, this is one of the main uh, topics of their tweets, yes? the history of the Second World War, and uh, of course some of them are just um, uh, reminding uh, some important aspects, but many others are spreading this information about, uh, about the, the, the war. And of course we all understand why in this policy the, the main attention is focused on uh, the end of the war and the result of the uh, of the war it's uh, understandable uh, that that uh, victory over nazism is and probably will stay as a very important element of uh, remembrance uh, not only not only in in, in russia but uh, uh, the problem is that in the same time the beginning of the war is forgotten uh, the rebenter of molotov pact is uh, uh, is, is, is forgotten. Um, uh, Soviet crimes are, uh, are not uh, mentioned very, uh, very much. And there is no space for any dialogue because, uh, uh, for example, for us, for um, those who lived in East Central uh, Europe under communism for so many years, it is important to have a possibility to discuss, for example, the notion of liberation. You know? uh, our uh, remembrance, our understanding of uh, those events is, um, is different. Uh, and um, this current um, stream of propaganda uh, does have no space for any debate. There is uh, only liberation possibly, and uh, every attempt to discuss this uh, uh, is attacked as um, uh, an attempt to rewrite the history of Second World War, um, uh, etc. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, this uh, kind of propaganda is following the Soviet pattern, uh, which was set uh, personally by uh, Joseph Stalin himself in 1948, when the first documents about um, Rebenter of Molotov Pact were, uh, were published uh, in the United States uh, under uh, guidance of Stalin, a special brochure booklet was prepared by Soviet authorities and translated into many languages called to, uh, falsifiers of the history. Yeah? And uh, if you read this, um, this booklet now, it's almost 100% the same uh, as, as this contemporary uh, propaganda of um, Russian, um, uh, Russian uh, authorities. Uh, and of course, we can understand why Stalin defended his policy, but I think there is no need uh, for, for Russian Federation uh, if we take into consideration that Russian people were the most hit by 
uh, and the most suffered uh, because of, of uh, communist uh, repression, Soviet repression. There is no need to defend his um, uh, his his policy, and there are other aspects. Yeah, as as uh, as it was said, the price paid by the Soviet citizens for the occupation and also for the victory uh, was uh, unusually high, and it was also because uh, of the mistakes uh, of Stalin policy, not only pact uh, itself, but uh, many, uh, many others. Uh, not, the Soviet Union was not prepared for, for, for war because Stalin believed that this friendship with, uh, with Hitler will last longer uh, than just uh, two, uh, two years, etc. So there are many things uh, which uh, should, be, should be discussed, but uh, now, uh, instead of discussion, of course, uh, uh, I am really glad that we still have a lot of people in Russia and also the civil society. Uh, so we, we have a possibility to discuss those issues, those topics with you, and I am very grateful for it. But uh, uh, unfortunately, we, there is no space uh, to discuss them with, with the uh, Russian uh, uh, authorities. So in this situation, I think uh, there is much more uh, to be done also on the European side. And uh, I would like just to give you one example. There is a very important um, uh, website and the whole project dealing with uh, uh, disinformation, mainly uh, Russian, I mean Russian authorities, disinformation, EU versus disinfo. And um, uh, right now there, there are like uh, 50,000 examples of this information published on this, on this website and only 100 of them is referring uh, to history. So uh, I'm afraid that uh, this group, which is uh, organized by European External Action Service, is not paying too much attention to the problem of historical uh, disinformation. Uh, and I think it's a kind of mistake because uh, this uh, disinformation is not only about history. So, you know, because uh, if it would be this way, just as a problem of some group of historians or fans of history, it would be good, you know, and that uh, we shouldn't do anything more. But uh, I'm afraid that uh, the goal of this uh, disinformation is, is much more important. It's not uh, about, about the past, it's about the present situation and about the future. Uh, this, this, this information is undermining our societies. It is uh, making a divisions inside uh, um, uh, Europe. Uh, it's, uh, it, it is attempting to, uh, to, to paint some black um, a picture of, of some nations, uh, etc. There is a, a quite visible context of um, uh, of the revolution of dignity in Ukraine, and uh, this um, uh, disinformation campaign this, uh, was was intensified uh, in in uh, 2014 and afters afterwards. So um, that's why I think. Um, as European Union, we should be not not only be much more aware of these uh, issues. Much we should much more debate uh, the past. Even in some of us, things that it's closed chapter of history. Unfortunately, is still not closed uh, chapter of 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 history. But uh, we should also do. Uh, much more. So that's why I'm so thankful for, for establishing uh, an informal group on European uh, remembrance for the last uh, resolution of European uh, Parliament and judging uh, by the reaction of the President Putin himself uh, on, this, um, uh, on this resolution. I think it's a kind of proof that uh, such actions are uh, good actions um, versus th those attempts of disinformation of, in fact, rewriting the past, because those who are blaming others uh, on uh, attempts to rewrite the past, in fact, they are trying uh, to do it uh, uh, by themselves and do it again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lukas. And of course, as always, your insights are uh, very important. Uh, yes, a lot to do <laughs> until I think regimes like uh, 
the Kremlin regime today and uh, other regimes, uh, uh, they are trying to use history to approve their uh, aggressiveness today. Uh, I think it is the main idea why uh, Kremlin regime today is uh, doing a lot uh, to restore Stalin uh, authority, how to say, and to, to change uh, all this, uh, the truth, uh, which we already lived for, for some decades in. And uh, uh, of course, uh, it's, it's, it's very important uh, for countries around, and not only. When I hear today from uh, Kremlin propaganda that Navalny is Nazi, and uh, all Ukrainians are fascists, uh, all of us, of course, also, it's narrative that all those, they are against uh, uh, dictatorships, against authoritarian regimes, they are Nazis or fascists, including Belarus people. They lost a lot because of Nazi occupation. Today, also in Russian propaganda, we see that those people they are fighting for just for free election, they also are blamed or named as Nazis. Uh, we will have uh, opportunity to, to, to see our audience as well. We have at least one uh, uh, raised hand. Um, but before that, I would like, uh, you know, to, 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 to take some minutes. It is very sensitive question was um, mentioned already. And it's very sensitive in the country uh, I am from, Lithuania and other countries. It's um, collaboration. I, I am sure that we will not be able to elaborate, to explain everything and to find the all answers. But since it's so important, and since it is uh, really new generations in, in my country uh, are more and more uh, doing their own investigations about, about, about everything. So maybe uh, Roger, uh, Dr. Roger, maybe you can add something on that very important issue. How to deal with such painful past of countries like my, when we lost our statehood, during two occupations, some people were forced, some people maybe uh, joined some, some ideology, ideology. So could you, could you elaborate a little bit on that very sensitive and painful question? Uh, of course, uh, as I, as I uh, mentioned in my, my brief presentation, I think what one has to realize is that there are many reasons and motivations for people to collaborate or indeed to not collaborate but the pressure to collaborate that this is essentially what totalitarian regimes do or did uh, was that they forced ordinary people to make extraordinary decisions decisions that they would never normally have to make uh, and whether that would be to betray your neighbor because you're fearful that uh, otherwise you know that that person might be betrayed anyway and then you'll be questioned as to you know did you know they were there and all that sort of thing so there's a sort of a, an unspoken pressure it's not necessarily a direct pressure uh, to to collaborate or cooperate with the regime um, uh, and as I said it's not it, it's actually I think in a minority of cases it's ideologically motivated I think in many cases it's motivated by much more sort of everyday uh, human concerns and you look at the example of um, uh, of occupied Poland, for example, where, which is the only country in which um, in which the death penalty applied for 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 those hiding Jews. So um, obviously, people didn't tend to do it very willingly. Uh, and again, if you if you knew there was a Jew, you know, hiding in the house next door, it was probably in your best interest to tell somebody. So it doesn't make that doesn't make those people necessarily anti-Semitic or Nazi or fascist or anything. It makes them ordinary human beings who are fearful for their for their future and for their children. So I think we have to appreciate when we look at these things that there are many motivations for what in retrospect from our comfortable liberal democratic society that we live in, from this perspective, looks like a heinous act, looks like a horrible act. But from the perspective that in which they found themselves is actually uh, perhaps not, uh, not 
understandable but can be explained, can be rationally explained. And I think we have to have the, the sort of intellectual honesty and bravery to recognize those, those facts. Um, I think I was, I, as I was listening to uh, Rukesh, I was thinking a very good um, example here in all of our thoughts and discussions, particularly about remembrance and the difficulty of remembrance. Um, a good example is that of, of Germany uh, and the way Germany has dealt with its uh, dark past, shall we say. Um, there's a wonderful word in German, I'm sure some of you know, which is Vergangenheitsbewältigung, which is the, the, the process of coming to, coming to terms with the past. And that past, incidentally, is only ever the Second World War and the Holocaust. Um, but this is a very sort of hot topic in Germany still. And it was one that really took, a, took quite a long time to get going. So we have to bear that in mind. It didn't, it didn't really get going as a process, as an intellectual and public process really until the late 1960s, 1968 was a very, a very seminal moment in that process. Um, and really through the late 1970s, early 1980s, you have the Historica strike, so very sort of public disputations between historians, primarily about this subject, about the Holocaust, about the, you know, the uniqueness or otherwise of Nazism. Um, and it's still going on today. I mean, this, it, it, and it, it Incidentally, I mean, this question of commemoration and the instrumentalization of history is, is a very important one in this process. If you look back to 1984, the then um, German president, Richard von Weizsäcker, made a very important speech, um, 19, I think it was 85 actually, uh, in which he addressed this question of Vergangenheitsbewältigung, coming to terms with the past. And he sought to try to to not only confront and a very clear-eyed confrontation with the past, honest confrontation with the past, which is what we are all hoping that Russia can one day do. He not only tried, uh, uh, advocated that, but he also advocated effectively the instrument, instrumentalization of that, of that dark past, i.e. the idea of setting Germany up and saying, this is, this is our history, we honestly acknowledge it, we look it in the eye, but we define ourselves against it. So it became an integral part, rather than a destructive element of the national psyche and the national sentiment, it became an important unifier and an, an important part of the national narrative. It told the German people, this is what we are not anymore. And I think that we can hope that one day something similar might happen with Russia. But it needs that that honest, clear-eyed um, uh, assessment and reflection on the past. And as Irina said, and um, this is you know an essential part of you know democratization and development of civil society and all of those things that we want to see. But it, it's an integral part of that process. It can't be avoided. Thank you so much. I hope that uh, in my lifetime I will be able to witness uh, different Russia, including uh, uh, Russia, Russian past. But Irina, I think you also would like something to add on, on that particular sensitive issue. Please, the floor is yours. Um, I want to say, can you hear the translation? I want to say that some things can be dangerous, making myths and some events heroic. And there may be diff different political reasons for those myths, for example, building a national identity. And these myths are always an obstacle for a dialogue. History can never be black and white. Historians are well aware of that, and this is a problem. History is very complex. Many things are so confusing. Take one biography, and a person may be seen playing different roles. And Russia is well aware about that too, when a person may be guilty in crimes against some people and then for a, a victim of state violence and not for the deeds which he was blamed in. This is what we witnessed in 1930s and 1940s. 
используют. И вот тут я хочу сказать, что э, э, в том числе и Our пропаганда very willingly uses difficult, different attempts to be quiet or to make something heroic, to turn some people into heroes. For example, people who are responsible for collaboration or for Holocaust turn them into something else. And the, the situation in Lithuania is even more complex. So we see that some people first were collaborating and then they were resisting. So any attempts to hide something or to make someone heroic, on the other hand, is to do with Soviet regimes, with repressions, and all of such attempts to build some heroic myths will always be an obstacle to such a dialogue. We say, no, these are our heroes, and these are our heroes, and we don't want to let it go. Uh, we have to also distinguish state memory and remembrance and human memories. The state propaganda and state remembrance precious people. But my generation is a good example. You know why was Perestroika possible? It was possible because people's memory is different. Yes, it was forbidden to speak about repressions or about some other tragic pages in the history of war, but people did remember. People remembered, and that's how this confrontation between state and human memories emerged. You can tell people that collaboration was something forced. If we hadn't betrayed Jews, we would have been killed. And this is a scheme, but there is a human memory which also has some responsibility for a girl from a next door who went to your school and who was then killed. And you know who participated in this um, process, not only Germans, maybe. Uh, speaking of uh, Nazism and fascism, you know, it's a collective figure for people. Because, you know, the other side, people in Belarus, what do they shout to the policemen? They shout fascist because this extreme memory in Belarus regarding this tragedy is also connected to the war. What I want to say is that history is very complex and propaganda tries to change history and this is something very painful and those sensitive issues are being used against us. We should also distinguish between the state remembrance, state memory and human memory. I'm sure that in Russia, no matter how it looks from the official perspective, in Russia, we have that other memory, memory of the civic society. We have books uh, about it. We have people who remember family history. And that can be grounds for us for our mutual understanding. Most people may say that there was no Katyn and that Germans are to blame and so on. You know, this manipulation only causes distrust to history, distrust to politician, politicians and a very cynical attitude to everything. And it would be very dangerous. Thank you very much. Of course, it is a very big and complicated topic. And it is much more complicated in the countries like my country because it was, how to say, double collaboration, collaboration with one regime, collaboration with another regime. Uh, I mean, two occupations, and sometimes the same people were collaborating uh, with both uh, occupations. 
So it is it is really very 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 complex. And uh, and thank you. Now we have uh, some raised hands, uh, and I will start. I will say that we will switch on your microphones uh, only. We will hear you. Uh, you, uh, I am asking you to introduce yourself, those uh, who will be invited to speak. Uh, we will invite uh, all those they raise their hands uh, to express themselves now. And afterwards, uh, uh, our speakers maybe will be able to comment or answer if it will be some, uh, some, some questions. One more added, uh, but uh, he will be at the end. I mean, Andrius Kubilius. And now I see Emanuelis. Is it Emanuelis Zingeris or member of European Parliament? We also have on the list two Emanuelis. So first uh, is uh, on my uh, on my screen Emanuelis. Okay. Uh, good to hear you. Oh, very good. <laughs> yes, Emanuelis Zingeris. The floor is yours. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you for Russia for uh, permanently organizing uh, such very important roundtables. Uh, do you hear me, friends? Yes, we can very, hear very well. Uh, wonderful. Uh, so uh, I was, uh, I have a complicated fate. I am a, um, a Jewish guy in the Lithuanian parliament for the last 30 years uh, in, in building Lithuanian democracy from Saudi's time. In the same time, my mother, she's 99 year old and she spent four years in uh, Kovna, Kovna's ghetto and Nazi concentration camps, Stuthof and other camps there in Germany. So my family is uh, a survival family and uh, I spent my life trying to uh, fight and they fought against the uh, communist regime uh, together with Rasa, Andrews and other members of Saudis. And I have this uh, double look who is not the same double look. Uh, from my point of view, I would like to say uh, that uh, 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 we have inside one uh, uh, internal, uh, internal uh, problem. Uh, six million Jews, they use Yiddish language and they accept themselves like a European nation before Second World War. Can you imagine uh, uh, only in Lithuania, seven daily newspapers in Yiddish language? And uh, uh, most of them, they were Bundist, social anti social Democrats who were uh, uh, heavy anti-communist, uh, Zionist uh, newspapers like Yiddish Eshtima in Kaunas, Warsaw Talk, uh, uh, more like 400,000 uh, copies, huge uh, world, internal world of uh, Jewish separate nations uh, nation inside of European nations like Czechs, like Slovaks, mm, like uh, Lithuanians, like uh, 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 Poles, they accept themselves like a European nation, not looking on the, that it, it was cross-national, cross-national, uh, unique cross-national um, entity uh, using their ethnic Yiddish entity. And after that, of course, was double Hebrew small trend to rebuild Israel inside of that, who was in absolute minority before Second World War. So um, uh, uh, if you would like to have Jewish people on our side, Jewish people who are not together with Kremlin, who are uh, uh, American Jews or uh, Australian Jews or Israeli Jews, we should have uniqueness of Holocaust in the one of the first phrases who we are using. So for example, the real Israeli point or Jewish point about Lithuanian, Polish or Ukrainian resistance is uh, positive. Uh, just uh, I was uh, um, attending or I just indicated to uh, Israeli ambassador in Lithuania to bring flowers uh, to uh, Auxia. Uh, uh, she was a former member of parliament. She was a daughter of Vanagas. And, and the Vanagas was the leader of uh, uh, Lithuanian resistance movement uh, in the forest until very late, uh, uh, terribly killed by uh, KGB guys. Uh, and uh, uh, Israeli Minister of Foreign Affairs easily, easily uh, uh, asked the ambassador of Israel to go to uh, Kaunas and uh, to congratulate with flowers daughter. Uh, um, 
daughter of uh, uh, Lithuanian resistance movement, uh, congratulating her with his father uh, uh, contribution to, Litu to, to Lithuanian independence uh, uh, during uh, after Second World War fight. So uh, not to give the chance for Moscow uh, to uh, um, extend their influence on Israel and on American, uh, South African and Australian Jews is only with, it's possible to invaccinate the situation with one point. We should remain that Holocaust was unique Unique and like Russia uh, mentioned, uh, uh, in Lithuania, uh, we have a fact that was killed more like 90%, 94, 95% of Lithuanian Jews. Total annihilation of this European Jewish Yiddish nation. And uh, uh, we should have on board the point of those guys. We should show uh, that, that we are presenting Jewish opinion uh, of pre-war European Jewry together with, with us and uh, have in our hearts in our hearts a place for uh, Polish, um, Czech, uh, Lithuanian, Latvian, Ukrainian, uh, Jewish contribution to the statehood, to the culture of those countries and show the upper moral hand of uh, Moscow. Uh, and actually uh, coming back to the fact of uh, 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 Soviet victory. It's only one point. Uh, it was multinational uh, uh, military forces instead of uh, uh, so-called Soviet Union military. For example, my mother remember a Georgian tank, uh, guy who came out from tank, tank, tank uh, ta telling to um, my uh, uh, mother uh, uh, in a German uh, camp, uh, in German camp, Babinki, we еще живы. It was a Georgian guy inside of Soviet army. That means it was not only ethnically uh, Russian uh, unit. It was Georgian, Ukrainian, uh, 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 even Polish, Lithuanian, and other guys who were uh, behind so-called red uh, flag who don't pre not present their uh, uh, statehoods while well, Bolsheviks took over uh, 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 Georgia and Ukraine uh, after a few years after independence in 1918 in, in the 20s. So in this case, uh, we should have clear message to the uh, Jewish friends in the United States in Canada and other places that we presenting the anti-Kremlin revanchistic attitude about Molotov-Ribbentrop, who are a purely revanchistic and absolutely right. It's, it's about uh, current days, not about the past. Uh, uh, the Moscow propaganda, uh, terrible propaganda, uh, criminal propaganda about uh, um, Second World War. We should be, we should include the Jewish point about uniqueness of Holocaust, like a first uh, ethic, ethical uh, commitment uh, uh, to Second World War, and tell to Jewish friends we are together with you, and we understand that after 95% of killed Lithuanian Jews, uh, Jews is any stop it to be the other side. Uh, of dialogue, and we will present you uh, uh, in most humane, humane way. That's all, Rasa. Thank you so much for organizing this extremely important roundtable. Thank you for joining us, Emanuelis. Uh, I would like to ask other uh, people, they will intervene to fit into two minutes, if it's possible. Uh, so now on my list, uh, I see Viktor Grushin, Gushin. Uh, could you introduce yourself? Uh, uh, he's from Latvia, I think, yes? The floor is yours for two minutes. Yeah. <clears throat> Hello, uh, Victor Gushin, Director of the Baltic Center for Historical and Sociopolitical Studies in Riga. I'm thankful for the possibility to speak uh, during this conference. Uh, I should say right away that for me, uh, when I read the title of the conference, I had a question, how can we uh, tie uh, Nazi-Soviet pact and Holocaust? But thanks to the speech uh, of Irina, I saw such a possibility. I have just uh, published a big study uh, dedicated uh, to history of Bilbao during the war. And one of the chapters is about the tragedy of the Jewish population of the city. And to my deep regret uh, in 
uh, the local uh, Latvian uh, collaborating population was uh, actively participating in extermination of the Jewish uh, population. And even in the Nazi opinion, uh, Latvian uh, collaborationists uh, were more uh, brutal uh, when uh, uh, killing the Jews, uh, even than Germans. I believe that uh, the uh, topic of the reasons for Holocaust uh, should be more tied to uh, characteristics of nationalism, of those uh, drawbacks in democracies uh, that uh, existed in the political regimes of the pre-war states. And from this point of view, I think it is extremely important uh, to raise the topic of national collaboration there is a table prepared by the Russian historians, and according to this table, based on the uh, number of population of 10,000 people, the first uh, place among those uh, who had the biggest uh, number of collaborators is Estonia. Uh, Latvia is on the second place, uh, 738 people per 10,000 population. Lithuania is on the 11th place, 183 people per 10,000 residents. I believe within the framework of the topic that uh, is being discussed today, I believe it is extremely important to refrain from uh, politicizing and uh, ideologizing uh, this topic. This is very harmful for unbiased study of the problem. I think one of the important issues that should be considered within this topic is the topic of nationalism of the pre-war states as the reason for collaborationism. Uh, during the Nazi occupation. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I, I think this is an important topic, especially when we see chauvinistic and nationalistic uh, Kremlin's narrative today. Uh, so, yeah, of course, this should be studied, but I don't think this is only about different nations because of which uh, look at the collaboration with the Stalin regime, with the Soviet regime. Again, there are things to speak about here and of course uh, Latvia still suffers from this. I'm sorry for my political comment but uh, that's how I understand the situation. Andrew Stubilis, he is asking for 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 uh, for the floor. Andrew's floor is yours. I am trying. Okay. As uh, you know, no. he introduced himself, he is a Lithuanian member of European Parliament. Uh, and former prime minister, twice uh, politician in Lithuania since the very beginning of our independence. Well, sorry, sorry, Rasa, and sorry for making you know a little bit too much of Lithuanian presence, you know, in, in this uh, in this event. But really, uh, we are colleagues with Rasa, you know, and and I'm very very happy that she she took responsibility for this very important uh, gathering and, and initiative. So really, very interesting to 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 listen. I have a uh, very short, you know, comment and, and, and some question. I agree absolutely with, with uh, Madame Irina, uh, Gospoja Irina, on, on uh, you know, that we need uh, to be very open to very complicated, you know, problems, complicated issues, uh, uh, you know, of, of Second World War, of Holocaust, and so on and so on, and that is what uh, what we are trying to learn to do in 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 our countries, you know, in, in Central Europe, and that's that's for sure, you know. And and we have some personalities who really were fighting against uh, Soviet occupation, you know, at the very beginning in 1940s. Then they joined, you know, in some way started to collaborate with Nazis, and they started to fight against Nazis. Nazis then sent them to Stuttgart, you know. Uh, because of that, and then Soviets killed him when he came back, you know, and, and fought against Soviet. And you don't know how to really how to how to evaluate that 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 you know uh, that life and that personality. So uh, 
or when we are talking about more driven fact and, and, and consequences and Holocaust and everything else, you know, I see really what, uh, you know, my, my, my point or my question would be is that we have three areas which have different, you know, uh, despite the same history, but different reaction, different, you know, different attitude towards that history. Always we're talking about Russia and Putin. That is, you know, important topic, but I doubt if we can change Putin, you know, attitude towards history. We can hope that Russia at some time will become democratic, you know, and it will be much more open to the history. And that is some kind of litmus test to Russia, how we can evaluate situation of Russia, but we shall not change Putin's, you know, attitude. Then we have Western part of Europe, where perhaps this group can look more, more deeply into you know what we can do and how we can explain our side of history, how we suffer it, you know, from Soviet regime and why, you know, uh, sometimes our attitude to Moscow, to Kremlin, you know, regime is a little bit different from, from the Western part of Europe. But the major point which I would like to raise, you know, really is our Central Europe region. And where Remembrance Group can play a very important role because still, I think that we are not able to overcome our history in the most you know, open and most proper way. And that makes influence on geopolitical or, or let's say relationship in, in between other countries. For example, let's take Ukraine, Bandera. For Ukrainians, he is a hero. No who suffered, who was put into Nazi, Nazi camps. For Poland, he is, you know, uh, well, we know, we know what Poland thinks about Bandera. So, the, and that is, that is making an influence on, on relationship between you know, Poland and, and Ukraine, definitely. We can, we can name other, you know, examples. And that is where remembrance, open eyes to the history, are very important to change situation uh, uh, of, you know, of, of relationship in between in between of our countries in our region. So that's it's not my question, but my point and and what you know, how to say, a suggestion to your group, you know, to resolve those issues. Oh yes, we will. <laughs> yes, you should do it. Okay. <laughs> that issue is difficult to <laughs> to solve, but thank you for your insights. And now I on my screen I have. Uh, raise the hand of Platform European, and I would like to ask to introduce yourself and uh, on also two minutes because we uh, uh, have to, to go to the end. Yes, thank you so much, dear panelists. I'll keep it very brief. Um, in, you know, in, in this era of, especially, I think this event is very important. You introduce yourself. Oh yes, I'm uh, Tony Jans. I'm working currently at the Platform of European Memory and Conscience. Um, I'm from the Netherlands, so. In this time of, especially during Corona, of misinformation and conspiracy theories, and you know, uh, strategic competitors like Russia uh, legitimizing foreign policy with these kind of memory political sort of processes, I want to kind of zoom in and ask a question to the panelists about this um, this topic of kind of dogmatic binary choices. In a sense, and just to contextualize this, in the 1950s, uh, in the German Democratic Republic. There was an instance of um, a number of communist officials who expressed their desire to uh, reconcile themselves with the experience of Jewish victims in, in Eastern Germany and to uh, come to some kind of initiatives there to give them justice. And then the, uh, the central uh, uh, sort of executive bureau uh, failed to sort of recognize the idea that one could be, in fact, a communist and at the same time demand justice for another group, for, for, uh, for the Jews. So these, these communist officials were in fact um, suspected of harboring kind of how was described as cosmopolitan, uh, neo-fascist kind of neoliberal American tendencies and they were expelled from the party. So there was this idea of one either has to be uh, focusing on you know, the crimes of communism or Nazism. And this does seep into the issue that uh, Professor Morehouse discussed about this historical strife in Germany in the 1980s, where his discussion revolves around, uh, you know, should we either focus on the legacy of Nazism or communism? Should we be proud of our, in brackets, natural history or this kind of overcoming of the past? 
this kind of self-definition based on collective regret. And just to, just to summarize here, so this whole idea of dogmatic binary choices, in Europe, the 27 member states, all of which have different degrees of experience, either with fascism or communism, we have Italy's, we have Poland's, uh, you know, Netherlands and, and, and Bulgaria, as in, I'm wondering from an from a objectively historical point of view, how can we strengthen this kind of European historical narrative, which I believe is the foundation for a resilient European Union, without resorting to these kind of artificial, um, dogmatic, you know, binary comparisons between communism and Nazism, because it, it distincts obviously between each member state. So how can we do this responsibly without falling into that trap that the Russian Federation is doing, this artificial imposition from the top down? So how can we do this through concrete initiatives? It'd be very nice to hear from, from some of you. Thank you very much for your fundamental, maybe, question. And now last raise hand, Joseph, Joseph Koren. And then we will move to, for, to our panelists to comment. Do we have next speaker? We cannot hear. Maybe our host can comment on the situation. Unfortunately, we cannot uh, hear or see any commentator. So now I will move uh, for the final words of our all three panelists. So uh, Dr. Roger Moorhouse, you have the floor for short uh, comment and uh, maybe answering some questions or ideas were raised. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, um, I should, I should hear myself there. So I just think that's gone now. Um, the, uh, yeah, a few. I mean, very interesting points raised there in the questions. I think the, the, I'll go through a couple of them here. There was, I think, the first questioner um, sought to suggest that interwar nationalism in Central Europe was uh, a contributory factor in collaboration, which, uh, again, I wouldn't necessarily dispute. Um, but I would merely add a sort of a, an explanation, I suppose, of how, um, if you like, old fashioned uh, anti Semitism uh, in Central Europe, I mean, even in somewhere like Poland, in, in Poland has had in the interwar period had you know, enough people who were anti Semitic in their, in their outlook. Um, that was well, you know, reasonably well represented. Uh, in politics, but it was a different form of anti-Semitism from what the Nazis espoused. Uh, Nazi Germanist anti-Semitism in this period is is biological, is absolutely uh, a different animal, a different development from traditional xenophobic, perhaps religious, perhaps economic anti-Semitism. And though the, though the two can collaborate together, they are different animals and, and traditional anti-Semitism was not really, uh, didn't tend to be exterminatory in the way that, that, uh, that of the Nazis was. So there are differences there, which I think should be, should be acknowledged. That doesn't disprove the point, but it's merely a point of nuance that needs to be borne in mind. Um, I think the second question I was talking about, um, this, the, again, the difficulty of uh, getting into a, a sort of a hero worship um, narrative, which is one, one of those things that, again, should be, should be avoided. And it ties in a little bit with the third question as well. If you, are, if you have the freedom to look at your own history, uh, you, you have to embrace the complexity of that history uh, and the nuance in it. There is, there is nothing binary about, about the study of history. It's all about shades of grey. It's never black and white. Uh, and we all need to understand that. The problem is, of course, that, the, that our national narratives, the way that history uh, as, an, as an academic discipline gets boiled down into a national narrative that very often shades into uh, much more black and white. And that's something that needs to be avoided if possible. So as a, I would say, basically, it's never, it's never binary and it needs to be self-critical. 
uh, historical analysis always needs to be self-critical. It's very good to be able to celebrate uh, your own national successes as long as you can criticize your own national failings. And I think that's an, an important point to remember. Um, and how do we move forward according to the last, the last questioner? Um, it's, very different. it's very difficult to, to reconcile all of those differing narratives across Europe, across the 27 nations of Europe. Um, that is a task that I, I wouldn't want to take on uh, to try and make a sort of a, a coherent narrative between them. Um, but surely the only way forward is one of, of dialogue and discussion. And as I said, that sort of clear eyed uh, uh, engagement with the past, uh, honestly and without falling into sort of national hero worship uh, has to be a way forward. But it's a difficult task. Thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, and now the word is granted to Miss Irina Sherbakova. Irina, do you have something to? Thank you very much for your comments. They are very important. We have once again heard different opinions, something that are very painful in the discussion. Traditionally and old-fashionedly, I think, and add to what Roger and Rasa said, freedom and only freedom, democracy and publicity will ensure the correct attitude to history, an attitude with common sense. You know, Ukraine is opening up its archives quite openly with all the difficulties and all the problems they encounter. And the fact that historians interested in the Soviet history and now they turn to Ukraine because the situation with archives in Russia is much more complex. And I'm very happy. This gives me hope. I'm giving it as a separate example. And I know from my experience how difficult it is to break up stereotypes, to show that it's the USSR that fought in the war. It was not Russia alone. There was a huge share of Ukrainian, Belarusians, Jews in that army. There was a Polish army of Andes who was heroic in its fight against Nazis. There were many nationalities in the Soviet Union. By the way, it was used for propaganda in the Soviet times. We were told it's our victory, it's our joint victory. They wanted to unite us by that victory. But now it's Russia. In the Western world, in Germany, for example, I hear that Russia now presents itself as a main winner of war. And of course, this is something that has to be explained to people. It's the Soviet Union, not Russia. It's a very important part and very important element. You know, binary comparisons are always something flat and something very simplified. Quite often, due to our official policy, Russia is identified with a state. And of course, there are grounds to do that when people share the views of the state. But you know, the country, the people and the state is something different. People from the Baltic states should easily understand that. A country and people are not the state. People are not the state. We are 
They're trying to tell us that the state won the war, but indeed, speaking of this victory, people were the ones who won the war, people with different biographies, with different history. And I think that someday we will see that uh, the state policy will fail. We see now the state policy in respect to war uh, history. In the end of the 80s, we did have some hope, and I hope that we will live to the times when this hope will emerge again, and it will be the memory and remembrance of people rather than the state, a very repressive state. And this is why we are speaking about millions of our soldiers who died, who died in this terrible war, but they are to blame for not bringing the true freedom and democracy, because it was the state which used the fruit of this war. And this is the tragedy, the tragedy of perception of this war for many people. And I think we should remember that. Thank you very much. And now, very last comment for our commentator, <laughs> Lukas Kaminski. Uh, floor is yours for last words before I will. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to start uh, with a word of thanks to Emmanuel Zingeris, who uh, give us, um, I think, important perspective uh, on, on Holocaust, because uh, 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 we shouldn't remember this tragic uh, experience just an, an abstract tragedy, and also um, um, attitude, uh, which is uh, fortunately um, more popular right now, but, uh, of remembering um, individuals, uh, reminding uh, the names is not sufficient also enough, because uh, as, uh, as you said, uh, uh, we lost uh, a nation, in fact, you know, uh, six, million, uh, six million people. So we should also remember in Europe, Holocaust, as a uh, tragedy in this sense that we lost part of us. We lost part of uh, part of Europe, and I think this perspective is is is, is very very important. But but coming uh, back to our main topic, um, uh, it is obvious that we cannot remember uh, remember everything, and uh, uh, we need to, to to select on every level, European, national, uh, sometimes regional, etc. Uh, and uh, it is quite natural that uh, we would like to, or we, we prefer to remember, you know, the glorious aspects of, of history, the moments, the people uh, of which you are proud of, uh, etc. who could, or the events which can inspire us uh, today, but uh, we, we shouldn't stop in this point. We need to also to remember those not bright, dark pages of, of our history on various levels again, uh, as a warnings, uh, as a warnings uh, in, in various uh, various sense. And uh, uh, I would like to join uh, Prime Minister Kubilius, who, who said that uh, uh, we need to be uh, open for a debate also, not only expect a debate uh, or openness for a debate, for example, from Kremlin, but uh, somehow to give an example, uh, how to openly debate uh, even the hard topics uh, of, the, of the past. Uh, and of course, uh, this is a partial answer for the last question asked by Teun Jensen. Uh, as, as also uh, uh, Roger said, that, that this, this debate, uh, debate is crucial, but uh, uh, I would like to suggest one more uh, aspect. Uh, I think uh, it is good in those uh, debates uh, focus on victims. Of course, I'm not saying only on victims. We need also to remember uh, the perpetrators. Uh, but I think that focusing on, on victims, uh, not only our victims, but also other victims, I think this is the quite good way to understand each other, because uh, if we will uh, understand the tragedy of our own victims, it will be easier for us to understand uh, uh, understand others. Thank you very much. 
Thank you. Thank you uh, for all our impressive speakers, uh, for your questions, for the thank you audience. Uh, you were following us. Um, our, our discussion, as I understood, was recorded. So my final uh, word is that um, we have to go forward and today is most important uh, to fight for democracies, I, I would like to say. Uh, everywhere, in every country, we see that uh, even the United States, uh, the uh, longest and the most oldest uh, maybe uh, democracy in, in the world, they also speak about that. So uh, in, in the Eastern part of Euro, people fighting for that and the only when we will keep our democracy in good shape, how to say, if with openness, with the freedom of speech, with the politicians, they're able not to speak, but also listen. And especially on those professionals like you, it would be uh, the, uh, the, the best way to go forward. And now I am finalizing our conference or maybe panel is too, too, too much to say conference, but it's uh, for some of you, uh, for me it's first meeting with you, but I don't think it's the last. And uh, I hope we will be in contact and we will, uh, we will do our best. I will finish in Russian saying that the vašu i našu svobodu. Uh, this is uh, uh, what Polish people uh, understand very well, Lithuanians understand very well, and we would like to put Russian people together into, uh, into that, uh, I think, very important uh, historical slogan for all of us here in Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much.